Hi, and welcome to the Irish American Politics Show. I'm your host, Gina London. In this special series, we set out to explore and examine through the eyes of the Irish American voter what's being described as one of the most divisive presidential elections in U.S. history. Joining us for this third episode is Professor Liam Kennedy, a highly esteemed Irish American historian and director of the Clinton Institute for American Studies at University College Dublin. Professor Kennedy, it is great to see you again, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Irish American Politics Show. Great to be here, Gina. Thanks for having me on, and thanks uh, for taking forward this initiative. It's great to see this show. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And we're going to give some broader perspective than what might be being seen on the day-to-day television politics show or the Mm -hmm. ongoing news countdown on polling numbers and in minute by minute on the race. And take a step back. Let's set the stage then with the view of America on the global stage at this point. There's a lot of anecdotes and there's there, there's feelings about this, but is there empirical data on what has transpired during this first term of the Trump administration? There is. And it's a timely question because a major global poll or survey uh, was published only two days ago and it's getting a lot of coverage now in the U.S. over the last couple of days. It was published by Pew Research, one of the leading global pollsters. And what's good about that is that they dig deep. They've been doing it for nearly 30 years, these global polls. And one of their key questions that they come at in different ways is how does the rest of the world see America? Okay, so you're right, a lot of anecdotal uh, commentary about how people view Donald Trump, how they view the United States. Quite a lot of it's negative, especially if you're living in Europe and the Western world. So what does the data tell us? And what it's telling us, and if we look at this survey, and 13 countries were surveyed, 13 democracies, a lot of them from Europe, also Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. So these are the world's leading democracies. Put another way, these are the countries you would think that would be America's allies. Yeah. So what are they saying? And they're saying that their publics, the people being polled are not the politicians, it's the general public. The general public are saying that they have lost faith in the United States, they've lost faith in its leadership. And there are two main reasons that come forward. One, a distrust of Donald Trump as a global leader. And two, the way the United States has mishandled the pandemic. Hmm. Well, what's interesting here is, of course, that Donald Trump goes on the record talking about how he's handled it well, how he's doing really great things about it. And and yet you're telling us that that's not what people are believing is the truth or seeing as the example of the truth. And then you relate that back to his his behavior as a leader and their distrust, as you describe it. What is that then split the difference between Trump the man, the greater impact of America itself, or can they be can they be divested? Or are they one in the same at this point? The role of the presidency, perhaps throughout the years in general as that leader, but then taking first with the idea of Trump and the standing of America, as you described it, with its lack of trust around the globe these days? That's a really good question. And one of the reasons it's such a good question is that the the, the association between the American president and America as a nation is very tight and it's very close, okay? Not a mere symbolic figurehead as sometimes is the case of a president. People around the world associate America with its president for better or for worse. And this is why it can become a question of uh, perception. And that's very, very powerful in this case. So what are some of those perceptions? Just briefly, um, in the Pew Research poll, several European countries hit their lowest figures in 30 years in terms of how they view the United States. That includes Britain. That includes Britain down to 31%. That includes Germany at 26%. In other words, those are the numbers of people in those countries that think that America is doing a good job in the world and it can be trusted. Those are awful figures. These are your transatlantic allies. So the perceptions are very powerful. However, let's untangle it a little bit, which is what you Mm -hmm. suggest that I do. Is this all about Trump? Well, I don't think it is. I think that already, if you look at the, the transatlantic relationship, America was already pivoting and away from that relationship under Obama. It was beginning to focus more on China and on the Pacific. And so there's a movement here that Trump has exacerbated. It's a movement that he has handled so badly, he's alienated even more people around. But nonetheless, there has been and there is a a realignment of global powers going on. 
whereby the United States has become more isolated, but Trump has exacerbated that, and that has deeply alienated a lot of former allies. And now the question that I would like to look at is take, taking the taking the globe, and we've got the transatlantic element, we've got the the other other parts of, of the world that you just mentioned, and then maybe that potential pivot hmm. purposefully or or, or an, accidentally or by potential default mechanisms from Trump and his style. Hmm. What is that connected to desire or will from the American populace, or is it connected? Is the Americans that are are the Americans that are supporting of Donald Trump or his base or his maybe his transactional supporters? That could be some of the Republicans that are saying that there's some economic benefits for them. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily de approve of his style per se. But is that group that would be supportive of Donald Trump? Are they reflecting in that, or is this happening without their support? What is that connection, if any? That connection is very powerful. And this is where it plays back into the election that's coming up. Um, Donald Trump knows that when he pushes back against this international order that he identifies with liberalism, right? That he identifies with American presidents before him. Really since 1945, clearly the United States, most powerful nation in the world. And, and the, the, it really helped shape the world in its own image. We sometimes call this the liberal world order, We right, with the United States at the heart of it. That world order has been crumbling and is now falling apart for a range of reasons. One of those reasons is the surging nationalism that we're seeing and populist author authoritarian leadership that goes with it in many parts of the world, including democracies. So Trump is part of that trend. But back to how this plays to his base, his base love that he's pushing against this world order, just the way that they love that he's pushing against the political order in Washington, or at least that's what they perceive. So they think that there's a close relationship there, that what Trump is doing is trouncing liberalism at home and he's trouncing it abroad. And so they're absolutely behind it. And where you see that most powerfully is in his language of us against them. And that's his play card for the election. That's been his play card for the last election. That's what he does. Now, the them could be immigrants. Them could be China. Them could be COVID. Or you could actually link it all together and call the pandemic a Chinese flu. You know, mm -hmm. it's classic construction of the other. And it's scaring Americans. And that's good for Trump. It might be good for Trump. And you talked about the a little bit the, of the decline of this liberal internationalism as you described it around the world and yet mm. we've got this Pew research that you just talked about that shows several many countries that would be in the international arena mm. are not supportive of his style so now I'm curious about international liberalism as again as you describe it in the world we've seen of course Poland re-elected a more nationalistic style of government is there a trend globally away from internationalism or is it a spike that is potentially going to go away what are you seeing what are the indicators around globally this potential to go us them in inward more often i'm afraid the trend is with nationalism it looks that way um you know, we've had a period of what some would call globalization, at least since the end of the uh, the Cold War, right? So I mentioned before the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, constructing the world in its, its, its image since 1945. We're all aware of that. That really starts to fall apart, I suppose, with the end of the Cold War, because although globalization comes to the fore and the United States promotes that, it promotes free trade, it believes that this will be in its interest. It believes that borders will begin to collapse. The United States will gain from that process. Process. What has happened, of course, and especially over the last 10 years, and especially since the financial crisis of 2008, is we've learned that the United States has not benefited from globalization as much as it might have done. And that there are some who have won in that process, but a lot of Americans lost out. And a lot of those Americans who lost out through the process of globalization, guess what? They voted for Donald Trump. So we come back to that relationship between the domestic and the, and the international. And let, I'd like to split the idea of who's benefiting or who, what areas around demographics or regions or mm. ages are benefiting or not benefiting around globalization. You just talked about the, the potential economic impact that the, the United States experienced. It wasn't maybe the way some people would have liked around their, around their jobs. And jobs, of course, is such a driver for voter turnout and the way people vote. 
all around the world, not just in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so talk about that job connection, the economic connection around that particular element around globalization versus nationalism. But then I'd also really like to hear your thoughts around millennials and the technology aspect of connecting at a global level. Mm -hmm. And is there a disconnect between the a, a desire potentially to connect all around the world with that technology provides and that many younger people are growing up with this as part mm -hmm. of who they are mm -hmm. versus who's leading this nationalism approach. Is it purely economic? Is there a, a push against it? What mm -hmm. are you seeing around those particular drivers? There's a lot at issue there. Um, I think you're right to parse this. I don't think we simply have a solid block of Americans who are nationalists and a solid block who are globalists. Um, it can look that way. You know, if you color up the maps of the United States, red and blue, uh, you know, to remind the viewers, you know, that is basically to color them up as you know Republican or Democrat. It can look like we have um, you know Democrat progressive coastlines. And then this massive blue in the middle, which is Trump country. And sometimes red, that's in, red, in, red in the middle. Right in the middle. And sometimes that's no red. You said blue, red in the middle. Blue oh, on sorry, the outside, yeah. red. Yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. Sorry. So that that kind of binary that is is deeply stereotypical. And I don't think it helps us to think about America in those terms. But but you know, people will have seen those maps. You will hear people talk in that very broad way. Um, yes, there are trends there. We do know that um, that the, the the deeper kind of seated nationalism in the United States tends to be rural, perhaps suburban, we tend to find that the bigger cities in the United States trending more progressive, more liberal. Of course, there are also relationships between that and immigrants coming into those big cities, more diversity and so on. So there are trends there. But if you take the trends through then age and generation, as you were suggesting, and into the millennials, you know, those, those trends can flip somewhat. And you will find that a lot of younger Americans uh, will align themselves with a much more cosmopolitan global perspective, which has a lot to do with their ideas of networking with you know like-minded people and other people of their ages so there's a there's a more complex picture than we sometimes think I think in that in in that sense but there are deeper trends and one of those which again I think links the international and the domestic is that whilst America has seen itself very broadly as a liberal democracy since at least the middle of the 20th century, there's always been a nationalist undercurrent in the United States, right? It's, it's, it's several hundred years old itself, right? It goes back a long way. That undercurrent bubbles up at times, but it's doing more bubbling at the minute. It's bursting into the mainstream. And that's become fascinating. So the United States has, I think, become hyper-partisan in its politics. But you mentioned the political differences, and the one thing we haven't mentioned are the cultural differences, mm. because those are hugely important. And those also somewhat you know, cut across lines of generation uh, and class and so on and so forth. Um, and the cultural differences are part of the drivers of whether people are clustering more nationalist or more liberal in the United States. And that has that's a gap that has deepened and I think it's fair to say, it's very clear, that President Trump has helped deepen that gap because he sees it in his interest to do so. Based on history, since that's, that's your area of expertise, are you seeing, and we talk about history repeats itself and history is prologue, are you seeing enough division being sown potentially by Donald Trump and enough cultural division and the animosity and as you described too the partisan tension i mean i'm american you can hear my accent i live here in ireland however i do have a global perspective i think having lived all over the world but when i talk back to my family and my friends who are still in the united states they tell me they have never seen it as tense as before i mean friendships are being lost over a meme being sent yeah. out around yeah. donald trump or not mm -hmm. donald trump mm -hmm. based on your experience and your analysis of history how deep are these tensions and what, I know predictions and speculations are tough to do, but what potentially are the different outcomes that could happen, not just with the election, but the response to the election? Hmm. Well, the first thing I'll say is I'm not an historian, okay? Not that I want to renounce um, that particular form of scholarship, some of my best <laughs> friends, etc. cetera, okay? Um, but nonetheless, um, you were right to point backwards because there have been moments in American history that would suggest to us some of what's going on today is not that new, 
right? Um, there have been waves of populism in the United States. Uh, there have been waves and moments of leadership that one could perhaps call authoritarian. So you could say that this is not absolutely a new moment. Um, I think it's useful to look at it in the long uh, in the longer term, and one of the ways to do that is to try and take Trump somewhat out of the picture. That's hard to do because he's standing there screaming and say, "Look at me!" Um, but if you do take him out of the picture, I think it's more helpful to think about Trumpism rather than Trump. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. In other words, what does he represent? What did his ascent to power tell us about America? What does his administration tell us about the American political system today and American culture? And what are we going to learn about that when he's gone? Um, <laughs> if, well, we don't know when he's going to go, but when he eventually goes. And, and if he doesn't leave a dynasty behind him. And, and I don't think he will leave a dynasty behind him. Do, do, not, do not give me Ivanka in 2024. You didn't just say that. There are people who want to do that and other members of the family perhaps rather than Ivanka. But we'll see. There certainly is, I think, a dynastic desire with Trump. I think yeah, no, for is. sure there is. I mean, we, we, um, see, we see that. Keep going. Well, yeah. So what's, I, what's the Trumpism effect, as you were alluding to? The Trumpism effect, I think, is really fascinating. Um, um, and, and, and you know, scholars debate whether it exists or not in the way, let, let's say, Thatcherism clearly did and does and, and becomes a, a kind of ideological influence on a generation of politicians. Uh, I don't think Trumpism exists in that way. I don't think it will have quite that impact, although I think that his example of populist leadership will play powerfully within the Republican Party for some time to come. But the Republican Party after Trump is going to have to resurrect itself in some fashion. It either goes even more fully right wing than it is at the minute, or it tries to reconstruct a center. So I think it has a crisis if he loses. I think it has a crisis if he wins, but that's another story. The Republican Party is in trouble for all kinds of reasons, because the Republican Party right now is Donald Trump. And so they have wrapped everything around him. Um, this is the first time in modern history that the Republican Party for the convention, for example, as you know, Liam, didn't put forward a platform. No they platform. simply it's said it's Trump. I mean, that it was it didn't get a lot of news around around the world in headline fashion, but it was a striking departure from Absolutely. any other convention, not just because it was on it on virtual, but because they didn't even bother to yep. put a platform together. It was a reality TV show, it was nothing else. And 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 the thing is, you know what, his base actually lapped a lot of it up. He he, you know, he 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 had a little bump in the polls off after after that. No one seemed to miss the policy platform, you know. Yeah. Why would you bother with one of those things? You know, it's only politics. And that's the sort of thing I think people are a little wary, wary of and even more than wary, worried about. That is to say, has Trump taken a wrecking ball to the American political system and process to such a degree? that America's already had lost a lot of faith in democratic institutions before he became president. But yes. those figures are really so low now, you wonder, how do you rebuild it? Which of course then takes us to Biden. If Biden does win, I think there's a huge onus on him to do the near impossible, which is somehow to restore and reconstruct, restore America's image abroad, restore faith in democracy at home, and construct the institutions that are crumbling before our eyes under the Trump presidency. I'm not right, sure because you mentioned because Liam, if I can interject for a second, you mentioned that the Republican ha Republican Party has a lot of work to do to reconstruct yeah. itself. But I would contend that the Democratic Party, yeah. the two party system in of itself, has yeah. a lot of reckoning to do. It absolutely has. The Democrats, uh, whether Biden wins or not, have a lot of problems. I, I think that at the moment what you're seeing is a very unusual sense of unity where they're trying really hard to keep behind Joe Biden. But we know there's a progressive left that does not want him as president. And we're hoping that he gets out of the way within four years when he becomes mm -hmm. president. So you can see the schisms that are, are beginning to emerge already. And of course, if the Democrats lose, then there's a really big question mark of where do they go from there? I think they will have to, at that point, turn themselves apart and reconstruct and reinvent themselves as a party. Are there things that Donald Trump and the Trumpists national, the, the, the content of the rhetoric aside, the mechanics or maybe the style in terms of using social media as a way to even announce policies, mm -hmm. announce hirings and firings. Mm -hmm. Is there a shift in the, me the mechanics of politics that there might be some positives if we take away the content necessarily mm. that the trump era has brought to global politics most people would say no i think unless they're trump supporters uh, but i think it is a bit more mixed um i think that trump has in a sense really uh led the way in american politics absorbing and understanding how social media works 
Okay, there's a lot of liberals and a lot of leftists wouldn't agree with me on that. They would say we were working in that direction anyway. But Trump, I think, has been so powerful in that space um, that you have to now look at even you know younger you know Democrats who are becoming social media stars and think he partly opened the way for these folks, right? And and one has to acknowledge that there's been a deep right. change in that regard. The, the, However, Obama, the, the Obama campaign can certainly claim credit for being the first one to actively use social media to boost their numbers yeah. during their campaign. But yeah. then, like you're saying, people like Alexandria Octavio Cortez, exactly. AOC has been super active. And there's no differential between her public and her Twitter persona. They're acting as an amplification of each other the same way the White House and Trump's tweet, his personal tweet feed mm -hmm. is connected, completely intertwined. Absolutely. But there, there are lots of caveats there. I mean, what, one of the most obvious is, is that what Trump has done with his tr Twitter feed is not just keep his public informed, his so-called base he has debased the public sphere. And that is to say that he has allowed into political language, misogynistic language, racist language, and I'm talking about his own language, never mind the alt-right denizens of the internet who have now flooded into the mainstream because they believe that their dear leader is speaking to them. And when we talk about populism, we talk about the rhetoric of populism. And now, of course, with the mechanics of popping out a tweet. And there's, if my understanding is correct, there has never been a White House retraction, per se, of one of President Trump's tweets. They they continue to flow, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, what, like you said, and when he retweets something, the press will hold him accountable, even if he's retweeted something. Oh, and maybe he's deleted those types of really alt-right videos, mm -hmm. if I'm trying to remember. But mm -hmm. by and large, his public record through his Twitter feed mm -hmm. remains, and it does remain almost a dictionary of the language that you can go back and then you can mm -hmm. hide behind, perhaps, or use to bolster your own rhetoric that mm -hmm. you might have once not felt as comfortable sharing. Yeah. Now you can say, well, it's been already broadcast by the man in the White House. Mm -hmm. And that maybe goes back to feed why this global distrust of this person and the country that he represents so closely, as you said, is at, I believe you said, an all-time low in 30 years. Uh, certainly amongst um, Western democracies, that that that, uh, that is the case. Um, where I is his, his appealing? Is Where is the Trumpism effect having positive impact? Where are there countries in that Few yep. polls um, that are that are resonating with him. Poland and Hungary would be two examples. Uh, you know, so you know parts of the the fringes of Europe, as, as some would call it, uh, uh, that are you know struggling with their their democratic processes. You know that that's where you're seeing uh, at least some support in that regard. Also, of course, you know Poland appreciates the uh, military help that the Trump administration has given them because they're sitting with you know Russia beside them. So you know there's there's other things going on there in terms of admiring a strong leader uh, and so on and so forth. But um, I think the depth of uh, you know discontent with uh, the United States is certainly deeper than anything I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, there, there have been in, in democracies around the world moments of what we might call anti-Americanism. You think back to the Vietnam War and the demonstrations across the West. You think back even to 2003, you know, as America prepares, you know, and is, is involved in the, the invasion of Iraq. We had anti-American demonstrations across most of the big Western cities at that time. But people got over it, you know, it, 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 what, because what they thought, what they thought, I think, and what they fed into, and I would say I did this as a child growing up in Northern Ireland, is that we had a fantasy of America, right? We had a mm -hmm. fantasy that America was not just a global leader, but it was a leader for global good. And that that was a, fant a fantasy that America represented a liberal order, it represented um, uh, the promotion of democracy, but also, and this is important, I think, to what's changed, that America was the redeemer nation. We believed that this was a country that not only had redeemed itself, but could redeem the rest of the world through its leadership. I mean, that's the language of American exceptionalism, which has been spoken by American presidents for a couple of hundred years. That language is no longer spoken, but at the same time, we and I no longer believe in it. Mm, is there any way to reclaim that maybe not exceptionalism, but that modeling behavior, that that mm -hmm. helping others. Is there is there a way to reclaim that? Would would a Joe Biden presidency? I said you said it was nearly the impossible, but is there a way 
in your view, based again, you're not a historian, as you as you said, as you pointed out, but you are an academic. And so your understanding of what's happened before and the research around mm -hmm. what makes trends continue or potentially can reroute them or course yeah. correct them. Is there a way to change back or forward for the better? I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, but I want to sort of sort of segue to it from my last comment because one of the things we haven't mentioned, and 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 I honestly think one shouldn't have a discussion about the United States and where it is in the world and not mention, and that is race. Yes. Um, one of the deepest discontents in the United States is its racial unrest. All right, its inability to deal with its own history around race. Um, the issues of inequality never went away, and they have now surfaced in ways that are, on the one hand, potentially violent, but on the other hand, we hope full of promise and change for things that should have happened many, many years ago. But I don't think it's any accident that this has all surfaced during the Trump presidency. It's part of the unrest that he has driven. Now, I take that question up in relationship to how the rest of the world views the United States. Look at the protests around the world in support of Black Lives Matters, and yes. especially after the death of George Floyd. That is all part of what I'm calling this disillusionment with the United States, because that disillusionment is about its principles, its values, and what it supposedly stands for. And the way that the United States historically and the way that the United States today treats its black population is something that we should be concerned, alarmed about, and all supporting those who want to do something about it to move forward. Um, but there is um, a lot of disconnect there, as Americans like to say, in terms of how that might happen. But I think it absolutely plays into our starting point today about the image of the United States in the world. But back to your question more particularly, which was, well, what, what can the United States somehow repair uh, its international image? Can it rebuild alliances? Joe Biden says that that is his aim. He talks about restoration. He talks about building alliances. But I think it's a huge challenge because the world um, uh, before 2016 has moved back so fast that I don't think we can go back to it. I'm, I'm off the belief we shouldn't try to go back anyway. But we shouldn't be, I think, thinking about restoration. I think we have to think about what have we learned over the last four years and how do we build on those lessons? I suppose an academic would say that. But I think that, well, I appreciate that an academic would say that because I think it actually goes into a practical application as well, being one that works more in the corporate world now than the political world. But the idea of organizational change mm. comes to mind. And how do you change a culture? And the first thing that you do in that is to acknowledge that a change needs to occur mm -hmm. and then have the organized team, the, the senior leaders of that team, hold a difficult conversation or a series of difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that type of approach seemingly, and I wasn't here, but you were, during the Good Friday Peace Accords and good the discussions that led up to that agreement between the North and the Republic of Ireland. How were, first, of course, President Trump, even, I know we don't want to time mark this because this episode will go be ongoing beyond the time that we're recording this, but in the week that we recorded this, President Trump was in a live town hall, one of the first ones in the presidential campaign ABC yeah. News put on, and he, again, as a, as a black man, raised the issue of race and the record of race. He pivoted President Trump away from the American problem and said, I don't have a problem with race. He didn't acknowledge there was even a problem. He has not acknowledged that there is an undercurrent that is manifesting itself through the protests mm -hmm. and the riots and the global demonstrations around this. Back to the, to the North and the Republic though, what was that first, how does that discussion, how does those difficult conversations begin? Mm. It's a good question, and 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 you know one could uh, raise the same question. I think with other scenarios of conflict transformation around the world, and and there are yeah. many answers because there's many different kinds of conflict. But one of the core answers is it has to do with uh, listening and inclusion. Um, George Mitchell, who was the um, Northern Irish envoy, Senator George Mitchell for President Clinton to Northern Ireland, played a you know a considerable role in in helping to bring people together uh, and and help to manage the peace process. Many others involved, but his role was important. And when he's asked about what he did that was significant, he gives the same answer. He said, "I listened," and he said that getting to the end, he said, was only because I finally out listened most of them. You know, he, it took years of that process, right? It wasn't days, but partly that was about inclusivity. Everybody had to be allowed to say their piece. 
right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has to be heard. Everybody has to be seen to be heard. Everybody has to believe that they've been heard. And then the process has to build on that. Language becomes very important. Um, empathy, respect. Uh, this is not transactional in the Trump way, right? You don't buy the peace in that in that way. It's interesting to compare what he's been doing in the Middle East with what we're. I was going about. to raise that while you were talking about that yeah. because that's largely not a peace deal, but an economic deal. Talk about what's happening recently that with what? the Trump, Trump exactly. administration and yeah. Israel. Well, he he promised to you know to bring peace uh, to the Middle East as one of his many many promises, and uh, his. Uh, um, uh, his advisor, Jared Kushner, was tasked to lead that process. Now, that particular idea that he would bring peace clearly hasn't happened. And the big peace deal that he announced uh, really was, um, you know, a, a damp squib for most of the people involved. However, only in the last few weeks, Trump has had some relative success here because there are two of the Arab states have now stepped forward to say that mm -hmm. they will start to normalize relationships with Israel. Mm -hmm. But that's an interesting um, step in its way. I call it a step forward, a success for Trump, but it's relative. This is not a step forward or a success for the Palestinians. It's, right. It's and they've been uh, very outspoken about, about how they're not being given anything and they're not even having a seat no. at the table on this. No, no, this is a lot of this is economic. Uh, in, in the background is the Saudi Arabia versus Iranian conflict where everyone is moving around the chessboard on that. But a lot of this is also economic and opening up, uh, you know, the process of, of future deals between these states and, and, and the Trump administration. It will be very interesting if Biden is uh, elected because Joe Biden has, has always pledged himself as, as a very powerful friend and ally of, of Israel. But what we're seeing within um, the Democratic Party and also within particularly the younger realms of the Democratic vote in the United States is a lot of doubt about the way Israel has been moving and especially under its current leader. So I think that you might see a resetting of that relationship at that point. And the other thing to look at is how will the United States respond to Saudi Arabia if uh, Biden becomes um, president? Because Trump has moved very close to the Saudis, uh, yeah. basically allowed them to get away with murder, literally. Literally. Um, and he said that's because we're in a transactional economic relationship and that's the only thing that matters. I think that will also be reset by Biden. So I think that, you know, there's many ways in which Biden's hands will be tied. I, you know, with, with China, he probably can't do an awful lot that's different from what Trump doing, although I think that the trade deals will be less aggressive and so on. Um, I don't think we're going to move back to a world of multilateralism, which is what Joe Biden would like to do. But I do think that there will be resets, not a massive restoration, but resets. And those resets alone will be important. They'll be important for people regionally, such as the Palestinians, we hope, I hope. Um, but also, I think they will be important for how much of the world looks at the United States. What's at stake with November 3rd and beyond if we have the mail-in ballots that continue to come in afterwards, and maybe the election mm -hmm. will be called on November 3rd, which many are predicting. Yeah. But what is at stake, final question, final thoughts, for There's America and the globe? Yeah, I, I know. And it's such a big pitch up. You know, I want to hit it out of the park by saying the future of the world is at stake. But I, I'm reluctant to say that. People are saying that. People are saying the future of democracy is at stake with this election and, and certainly in the United States. Uh, I don't want to go that far. Uh, I think the institutions of democracy have been weakened over the last four years. I think if Trump remains president, they will be further weakened. But will it mean a collapse of America as we know it? I, I would still hope not. I mean, you, you know, and I know, there's a lot of people in the United States don't want to give up on it anytime soon, and that they will fight hard to push back at uh, this Trump presidency if it continues. We've seen that already. I think one of the interesting transformations we've seen is how a number of cities have become more autonomous in how they've run themselves in opposition mm -hmm. uh, to Washington and are uh, functioning in a different way to the way they might have functioned if it had not been Trump as president. In other words, America is transforming itself in relationship to these the strange presidential leadership. I don't think it's a particularly good transformation, but some of it's defensive and some of it means that I think that America can come through this. I don't think it will be the same country. I think it's going to be different. I think that when you've opened so many wounds, you can't close them. I think the time for reconciliation and reckoning on race has finally come. And I'm really hopeful this makes for a better America. A time for reckoning, a time for repair, a time for restoration and hopefully a time for a better America, which will impact across the world. Thank you so much, Professor Liam Kennedy from the University College of Dublin for your time to discuss 
so many variables, but the incredible impact of the United States and Trump as Trumpism across the global stage. Thank you so much again. And this was our third episode of the Irish American Politics Show. Please join us again for another insightful episode coming ahead. I'm Gina London. Thanks so much.